So moving on, um, we have the a great opportunity to have uh, Dr. Zhang, um, who is um, uh, has uh, has been at UC San Diego for a couple of years, um, and before that was an assistant professor at the University of Wisconsin Madison. Um, what fascinates me is some of the wireless sensing modalities that he's developed um, provide emerging IoT applications with different enabling mechanisms such as centimeter precision indoor localization for smartphones, 3D orientation, and position tracking for batterily batteryless uh, objects. So. Uh, Professor Zhang, uh, we're really interested in demystifying millimeter wave V to X and uh, take it away. Thank you very much, David, for your introduction. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I want to introduce our recent work on millimeter wave V to X measurement. Previously, I already presented some parts of this work. Uh, and uh, since this project lasted uh, for a long time, uh, more than one half years. Uh, this presentation essentially summarizes all the comprehensive results from our measurement study. As we all know, uh, V2X is a very important use case for the 5G networks. It will enable uh, remote driving, platooning, sensor sharing, a lot of exciting opportunities. Many of these use cases require very high wireless link capacity. And uh, millimeter wave is a niche technology uh, to satisfy the requirements of many of these use cases. But for a long time, uh, the practic practicality of this uh, millimeter wave V2X has been questioned. One, because uh, the directional beams used by millimeter wave radios may suffer a lot from blockage. And also under movement of the uh, UEs, of the mobile devices, the beams needed to um, keep uh, being aligned with each other between the base station and the UE. This will involve a lot of overhead. Plus, when you have uh, many UEs and uh, multiple uh, base stations, the interference management becomes intractable because essentially you have to pack a lot of uh, directional beams within the 3D space, and you have to keep changing that as the network topology changes. Our measurement study aims to demystify all of these challenges to understand whether millimeter wave V2X is really feasible and will there be any opportunities in the real environment. This measurement study is using a millimeter wave V2X testbed that we have deployed on the UCSD campus. Uh, also, we developed a 3D ray chasing software framework to enable the evaluation of uh, millimeter wave V2X in a large scale, uh, very accurate 3D simulation environment. Let me uh, introduce some more details of our experimental platforms. First of all, the millimeter wave V2X testbed. Uh, we have uh, deployed four millimeter wave base stations on the UCSD campus following the uh, specifications in the 3GPP standard. In particular, 3GPP has a lot of details about uh, the roadside type base stations or RSUs. And our configuration of the base stations mostly follow those specifications. And for the UE, it's just a millimeter wave radio mounted on top of a car moving within the campus. The millimeter wave radio device that we use is a commercial millimeter wave radio with an array of phase ray antennas. There are eight arrays and each is a six by six element phase ray antenna. We have uh, did some firmware hacking and software hacking so that we can control the beam patterns and the code book in real time. Furthermore, we have uh, built a 3D ray tracing environment for larger scale evaluation. The input into the ray tracing is the 3D model of the environment obtained from OpenStreetMap, as well as the vehicles putting into map and uh, moving within the map following realistic traffic patterns generated by the open source software called Sumo. 
And then the ray tracing simulator we are using is Wireless Insight. This is a well-known commercial uh, ray tracing engine uh, that can uh, simulate the propagation of the millimeter wave signals and also the impact of the phase ray antennas. We have uh, conducted uh, cross validation to just check that our simulation and the measurement matches each other. Uh, in particular, we created the 3D environment of the UCSD campus and specifically the site where we deployed the millimeter wave radios. And we found that uh, the test bed measurement matches the simulation in a reasonable way. And uh, we did the uh, trial run and uh, found that uh, the beam selection, the optimal beam sele uh, selected in the simulation and uh, in the measurement study matches very well with each other. Our experiments focus on four different aspects to re review the underlying challenges and uh, opportunities, coverage, beam management, blockage, and the spatial multiplexing. I will explain each of them briefly. There was uh, several white papers and the research papers recently, uh, mostly from industry, showing that uh, millimeter wave can achieve very good coverage, more than 84, 85% of coverage, even when they are having the same deployment density with the 4G LTE base stations. But those studies were done in the dense urban area, like the New York Manhattan area. Our measurement is uh, running the experiments in the UCSD campus, which is more like a suburban urban in environment. And we did the same co-setting deployment, that is putting the base stations, millimeter wave base stations at the same location as the LTE base stations we found that the coverage is actually very poor. Only 37% of the road segments are covered. And um, almost all the coverage is attributed to the roadside unit, base stations. And the base stations far away from the road to just do not uh, contribute much to the coverage. This again is uh, due to the well-known uh, short coverage and attenuation loss of the millimeter wave in comparison with the 4G microwave band signals. Uh, this implies that in order to really achieve uh, full coverage for millimeter wave V2X connectivity, we will need much denser deployment. In fact, our rough calculation showed that we have to double the deployment density compared with LTE base stations in order to achieve rainbow coverage. And, uh, but there are also some interesting opportunities. In particular for beam management, many people previously questioned that uh, using directional beams for high mobility scenarios like, U, U, uh, like V2X is impossible because the vehicles are moving too fast. It's impossible to check them using directional beams. Our measurement showed that uh, actually uh, this is not the case. In V2X scenarios, the movement of vehicles are more structured and also are more predictable. So as a result, beam management becomes even much easier. This figure is showing the angular patterns of the millimeter wave signals when the base station is serving a moving vehicle. We uh, so. Uh, people previously just assumed that uh, you will see dots everywhere scattered within this plot. But we found that uh, it's much more structured because the vehicles can only move along specific road segments and the road segments are sparse geometries in the physical environment. So as a result, the angles, um, the uh, signals angles are also sparsely distributed within the angular domain. This means that uh, for millimeter wave beam management, you can just uh, point to the beams strategically to a few directions where the vehicles are likely to be located. So the beam management overhead can be very low. In fact, uh, we found that even with the brute force beam scanning method, 
designed in the millimeter wave standards, the overhead is only about 1.7%. We also found that uh, the uh, millimeter wave uh, uh, propagation paths are quite stable over time, mostly because the majority of the time, the cars are far away from the base station. So the relative angle changes well, very infrequently. Only when the cars are close to the base station, then the angle changes in a uh, faster way, and that will deserve a more agile beam management. And uh, we also found that uh, it might be optimal to choose the beam pattern strategically depending on where the vehicles are located. For a far away vehicle, you don't have to uh, steer the beam very frequently, but for vehicles near the base station, you can use a wider beam to cover the uh, car to save some beam scanning overhead without uh, um, compromising the link, uh, link quality much. Blockage is another problem of concern, but we found that uh, it can be easily solved if the base station is mounted high enough. Uh, in fact, we found that if the base station is about five meters above the ground, then there's a very uh, little chance of blockage, about 4%, mostly due to uh, another truck blocking a car. And uh, uh, it, of course, this uh, really depends on the uh, whether it's possible to mount the base stations in this way, and whether uh, there's any uh, building in between the base station and the, the uh, moving vehicle. Uh, to, uh, and also we found that even if a uh, blockage happens, it might be easy to just overcome it by steering the beam uh, to find alternative reflection paths. This doesn't involve too much overhead because again, we found that uh, there is a pattern that we can follow to steer the beam towards some backup directions. Besides mounting the antenna higher, there's also another way to overcome blockage that is taking advantage of the multi-connectivity uh, capability in the 5G base stations. That is two or more base stations can serve the same UE simultaneously so, uh, to overcome blockage. Although the effectiveness of this really depends on the specific deployment scenario. <laughs> another problem is uh, spatial multiplexing. That is uh, how to pack the directional beams into the space to make sure that uh, they do not interfere with each other. We found that uh, receiver beam forming is extremely effective in overcoming this kind of uh, multi-beam uh, uh, multi in the first. But uh, transmit beam forming is uh, very hard to leverage because if you want to avoid interference uh, to another UE, you probably will also satisfy the performance of the UE that you want to serve. Uh, and uh, uh, I think due to time constraint, I will skip this one, which is about multi-array base stations. Uh, we also found that uh, uh, to uh, leverage the MIMO millimeter wave capability in V2X, actually uh, a lot of times we can use very simple solutions. For example, just allow the multiple phase rays on the same base station to generate beams to point to different directions for different UEs. Even without uh, additional digital beam forming or MIMO beam forming, the interference between the different UEs is often negligible due to the sparse separation of the vehicles. To quickly summarize, uh, millimeter wave V2X is an exciting technology in the upcoming 5G deployment. And uh, our study is using experimental testbed plus large scale ray tracing simulation to review the problems. And uh, uh, in the uh, negative side, we found that uh, coverage is a big problem. We need very dense deployment to achieve reasonable V2X coverage. Of course, that will involve, involve a lot of cost. But on the other hand, there's a lot of uh, positive side. We are optimistic about the network operations 
Even simple network protocols and operations can ensure very good performance in the millimeter wave networking scenario. The data set and simulation tools of this study have been published in our project website, and we have a very detailed paper, 14-page paper detail, uh, describing our findings. And you're welcome to Google to find all of these details. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Zhang. So I'd, I'd like to invite our panelists um, to come back on uh, camera if they can. Uh, we have a couple of minutes to ask some questions. I would like to open up to the board, to the other panelists, board members. Um, if you have any questions live that you would like to ask right now, um, please unmute and do so. Uh, and then we do have a couple that are in the Q&A. Uh, if you haven't gotten a chance to fill out a question in the Q&A, please do, and we'll answer those live uh, or um, the chat as well. So do we have any of our board member, Pam? Mark, I see that you unmuted. Hi, hey David. Yes, Mark. Um, I have a question for Dinesh, who was, uh, it's always an interesting challenge with very directional millimeter wave type radiation to, to be able to avoid some of these ghost images or uh, some other things that you showed, but do you think there's an opportunity here rather than to take our usual approach, which is, oh, let's put more signal processing on this, burn up more energy. Um, can't we just uh, change the design of cars very slightly so that they reflect in multiple directions rather than uh, ref than uh, act like a mirror? Uh, so, yes, I think there is an actual effort going on in my group right now on this end. So I think we have been trying to design some infrastructure tags, which essentially can reflect energy so that uh, you can detect we do it for them. Light. We do it for light today, right? Yes, exactly. We have retroreflective retro reflectors. Yes, exactly. Retroreflective <laughs> surfaces, right, for light. So we are looking into how you can do it for radar or slash. What if you could stitch something along a boundary of a car, right? Some surfaces along those lines, right? I think so that's an interesting idea. We are definitely investigating and seeing how far away it can work, right? And how do you make sure it's scalable? As in, let's say if you have a each tag and it has own identity, right? This should be unique enough to separate if this is car one versus car two, right? Yeah. And so yeah. we are definitely like trying out some ideas on that. And maybe by next CWC meeting or discussion, we could have something along those lines and to share with you. Cool. Excellent. Thank you. I may just say one thing, uh, Mark. Um, so, um, Pam Kosman, uh, myself, and some others are working on a project, uh, LiDAR Fusion, but this for uh, people in the ASD spectrum. And so enabling um, ER-based uh, glasses, but enabled by LiDARs. Uh, and there, you know, one of the problems has been that, well, how do we identify uh, and we are using tags, and that is playing out very, very well. So that's yeah. you know, a great direction, and uh, I think that Dinesh also will be able to be successful, you know, in sort of uh, guiding radar also like that. <laughs> very good. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much for the question, Mark. Uh, opening up to any others that want to unmute. There we go, Ar Artur. Yeah, I have a <clears throat> corresponding question because... We talk a lot about the LiDAR as cameras for autonomous driving, but are we not pushing the boundary? Because when we as humans are sitting behind the car, we don't have so much visibility beyond certain borders. And I think we try to very strongly push mathematics to find the solution, but maybe the solution is simple. So I'm trying to like look at if, if from the research perspective, you guys were trying to see, maybe we don't need LiDAR, maybe we just need a, uh, sort of simulate the human operation of looking and observing instead of just trying to make those cars being perfect in looking at the weather and everything. Uh, I know it's a bit bizarre question, but it's something which a lot of people are questioning those days in the industry. I can, I can maybe um, answer that question, Arthur. That's mm -hmm. well, a good question, but first of all, we are talking about various levels of autonomy. So when we go to level four, there's no driver. So what you are saying is that why don't we try to why don't we try to mimic as best as possible what the driver could have done and sensed and you know acted on, as opposed to 
uh, installing artificial sensors, which the driver today doesn't have. The human being doesn't carry a radar or ca doesn't carry a lighter with us, right? So that's the essence of your question that Correct. why trying to emulate the human driver as opposed to uh, these artificial sensors. Is that right? That's correct. That's correct. Right. No, I, so, you know, excellent question. But in the meantime, let's look at uh, not self-driving vehicles, but let's look at, you know, augmenting today's driven, you know, driver-driven vehicles uh, and seeing how additional sensors, which human beings don't have, but we are augmenting, you know, the human sensors with these other sensors so that we can sense and feel and can perceive uh, more than the human can do today. So these are two different things, right? One is ADAS, which is uh, we are, you know, assisting the driver uh, with technology to see and sense and perceive better. And the other is autonomous driving, where I agree with you that maybe, you know, if we can perfectly mimic how the human mind and human eyes see through uh, weather and things like that, that might be a good step. But these are two different things. And But I do believe, and I'll let Dinesh and Trong uh, you know, answer also. I do believe that uh, while we should be, and <coughs> yes, uh, we should be trying to mimic the driver behavior, that there's no harm in supplementing the driver senses with other senses so that we can see around the turn, for instance, which we cannot see today. And, uh, you know, leads to so many different uh, collisions. Great. So I think maybe I'll make a different, the way to look at it is different, actually. I think the way I see it is that I want these machines to drive car for me only if they are super safe and not killing around people, right? Okay. So as in like, if they were just doing as well as my eyes, right, then what's the point of doing all this, right? I want them to be really so safe, right? That I think I can just rely on them to really do a good job, right? See around the corners, see something which my human eye can't see, right? Drive in a bad weather without causing any accidents, any trouble, right? So that's the reason for all of this level four, level five autonomy, which we want to have, right? So that's number one, right? Number two, right? I think <clears throat> just to deconstruct your concept of like, let's say how we see and we perceive, right? Okay, first of all, we are really bad drivers, okay? Humans as such, okay? We, yeah, I think you can read DMV reports on that end, but that's a different matter of thought, right? But even with that in context, right? So what we do is we also have the same camera or eyes perceiving things, right? And making a judgment call, right? The only thing we have as a technology does not have, right? Okay. So one can argue, why not just use cameras and like essentially do entire depth estimation and everything from there, right? So eyes have very sophisticated way of, they can keep changing their apertures and so on and so forth to essentially look at it, right? And even after that, we make mistakes, right? So in summary, I think you want to like transcend that level, right? And two, yes, you could do it, but you want to do it better than that, right? Then only it makes sense for, uh, and to give you a different answer, right? I think it's surprising how government is letting us or letting most of these autonomous companies drive around, right? And while they're killing people out, right? As in the sense that, like, I think there has to be a higher standard for these things, right? You cannot, and again, you can only achieve that higher standard by driving around, right? So just to give a context in that uh, that scenario, right? And this is, uh, there is another story yeah. on the liability side of the things, but yes, I'll leave limit to that for now. No, I think it's, it's a very good point just, just, just to give you perspective. But I think that what for me was always interesting is that none of the autonomous companies started in bad weather conditions. All of them started in like sunny California, sunny Texas, where I think we should start from the, the wrong side of, of, of autonomous driving. Like, let's go to Alaska and see if there is no road, how you can really find the road. Uh, so that's why I'm so I, I I see a lot of academic studies around like LIDARs, cameras, but I think there is not enough pressure put of let's maybe like create a human digital twin and start to see the human behavior, how human is understanding the road. Uh, to your point, it's a complex, we are not, we are not simple uh, engineering device, but I think there is a lot of research to be done in this space. Very fascinating space. I always love the biomimicry uh, work, and I want to be cognizant of time. And we did have two very patient folk in the Q and A. Um, so if we can get one, maybe one or two sentences uh, to this first and then second question, we'll move on to the next. How do cars today uh, that have no connectivity communicate to the RSUs? 
So I guess that's a question that was asked from my presentation. Uh, that's an excellent question. And, you know, yes, I promise that uh, cars don't have to be smart to be using the whole uh, intelligent RSU edge-based, uh, you know, collaborative perception. But you're right, if there's no connectivity at all, then that's a problem. So uh, every car, uh, the expectation is that they'll have at least a DSRC or a V2X connectivity in the next three, four years. The question is, will it be loaded with 10 radars and uh, 20 cameras, or will it be a much cheaper model with just two cameras and one radar, or maybe just cameras? No, so connectivity is required. Uh, and then the, finally, uh, are you looking at side link communication for V2X? Shinyu, would you like to take it or I can take it? Oh, sure. In our uh, measurement study, we actually didn't look at the side link connectivity. We only considered the base station to UE connectivity. But this will be something interesting to look into, definitely. Right. And the, the extension to our testbed that I mentioned, where Qualcomm is working with us, the Qualcomm Automotive Group as well as the CV2X Group is working with us to extend our testbed, there we'll have side link. Uh, communication also. And uh, one of the interesting things will be that how to merge the work that Shinyu is doing in millimeter wave and this side like connectivity, how to, how to you know, uh, use both of those opportunistically, depending upon the conditions, depending upon the application needs and so on. Well, I want to thank all of our panelists. Uh, and I want to thank Dr. Day for this incredible honor to get to spend time with all of you. What you all are working on is going to have a transformative effect on mobility for the future, but also as we're hearing safety. I mean, we are talking about literally saving lives with the technology that is being developed here. And I want to thank you all for that and for this opportunity. So with that, I will uh, turn things over to Dr. Day. Thank you.